Okay, let's spend a couple minutes talking about some of the most powerful tools that we have uh, to analyze motion. When we analyze motion, we typically graph uh, the motion of the objects, and the three common graphs are the distance versus time graph, the velocity versus time, and the acceleration versus time graph. And each one of these will tell us different things about the motion of the object. So let's say uh, we've got an object and it's moving and we need to collect some data. Uh, the data that we're going to need to collect, we're going to need to know something about the time, and time is usually the independent variable because we can decide how long we want to let the object move, we can measure where it is at one point in time and then where it is again at a different point in time. So time is typically the independent variable. And so we'll need something then to measure the position of the object at different points in time. Now one of the uh, most common tools that we use in physics classrooms are um, spark timers or bell timers. Here's a picture of a, a common bell timer. It's just got a little arm that sticks out that uh, when you turn it on, uh, claps up and down at a nice regular rate. And then you pull that tape through it um, and it will leave marks on the tape at a nice interval. So if we did that and attached the tape to an object that was traveling at a constant speed, the tape would end up looking kind of like this. Each one of those dots would be a mark that was left on the tape by that uh, bell timer and the nice even spacing would tell us that it, the object was traveling at a constant speed as it pulled the tape through the timer. On the other hand, if the object was accelerating when it was pulling the tape through the, the timer, then the dots would end up being spaced more like this, and uh, the bigger gaps result from the fact that it's traveling at a faster speed at later points in time than it is at, at the early points of the motion. Um, you can also get that data from analyzing video because video typically takes a series of pictures. Uh, common video is played back at either 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. So each frame is like, uh, from that you can measure the, the position of an object like 30 times every second. So let's take a look at each one of these graphs and uh, the information that you can get off of them. The first one is a displacement versus time graph. And suppose we're analyzing the motion of two different objects. And the first one, we plot the data out, and we get a nice straight line like this, and it's sloping upward. And uh, then we have a second one, and we uh, plot it, and we see that it results in a best fit line like this. Obviously, the motion of the two things is a little bit different because they resulted in a different displacement versus time graph. If we consider both of them at one specific point in time, where that blue line is, we can see that the yellow one would have traveled a distance corresponding to this far, while the red one would have traveled a distance corresponding to this far. And if you've done very much with working with graphs before, you know that one of the most common statistics that we calculate on a graph is the slope of a line. Well, the slope is the rise divided by the run. And in this case, the rise is the change in distance on the y-axis, and the run is the change in time on the x-axis. So if we calculate the slope of the line, the red one is much steeper than the yellow one, but the actual value of the slope would tell us how fast it's going. So we plot out the graph, and the slope of the line is important on a displacement versus time graph because it tells us how fast the thing is actually traveling. If you have a horizontal line like this green one, well, that indicates that the slope is zero, and it means it's just not traveling at all. Now, let's think about um, a graph that results like this. In this case, we've got a nice constant downward slope, and this would indicate that uh, early in the motion, at some time early in the motion, it was this distance away from our origin, but later on, um, say at time two, the object out here was now only this distance away from the origin. If we calculate the slope here, the slope being rise over run, well since the second distance is smaller than the first distance, that will result in a negative value for the slope. And so a negative value then tells us that it was closer at the end of the motion than it was at the beginning. So the slope now is important because not only does it tell us how fast the object is traveling, but it tells us which direction it's moving. A negative value would indicate that the object is moving toward our reference point, and a positive value would indicate that it was moving away from the reference point. So on the displacement versus time graph, two critical pieces of information you can get, how fast it's going, 
and the direction it's going. Both of that would come from the slope of the line. Then, what if you plot out the data and you end up getting a curve, something like this? Well, remember the slope tells us how fast and the, the direction of the motion, but on a curve, uh, often we try and wonder, well, how do you find the slope of a line on a curve? Well, let's consider this thing at two different points in time, indicated by those red dots. If we look at the first one and just go from that first red dot straight up until we hit the best fit line, what we would do at that point, we would construct a tangent line. And a tangent line is just a straight line that only touches the best fit curve at one point. And you can do this by just laying your ruler down on the curve and, uh, and tracing the tangent line on it. So if we look at that tangent line, and then later on we construct a tangent line at this second point, we can see that those two lines obviously have different slopes, which means the speed has changed but both of them are positive, so they're still traveling in the same direction. But notice that this line is quite a bit steeper than this line, and so that tells us the speed changed over time. Well, if the speed changes over time, that means the object is accelerating. So the third critical thing that we learn from displacement versus time graphs is that anytime you see a curve on the graph, that indicates that something is changing speed or it is acceleration. So straight lines indicate constant motion, curved lines indicate, indicate acceleration. Now, our second really important tool is a velocity versus time graph. So suppose we measure the velocity of an object at a whole bunch of different points in time and plot the graph out. And if we get a nice horizontal line like that, well, that one's pretty straightforward. It tells us that an early point in time here, the object had some velocity. At a later point in time, it had the same velocity, so the velocity did not change. But if the object did change velocity, if it was accelerating, then the curve would look more like this. You might have a straight line sloping up. So here, at time 1, the object was traveling this velocity, v1, but later on at time 2, the object was now traveling at this velocity, v2. And once again, if we calculate the slope using the same techniques that we have all along, the slope of the line is equal to the rise divided by the run. But in this case, the rise is the change in velocity, and the run is the change in time, and change in velocity divided by change in time is acceleration. We can also figure that out by looking at the units. The unit on velocity is meters per second. The unit on time is seconds. And so if we take meters per second divided by seconds, we get the unit meters per second squared. And once again, that's an acceleration unit. So on a velocity versus time graph, one critical piece of information we can tell, the slope will tell us the acceleration of the object. Now, let's think about something else. If we consider that yellow horizontal line for a moment that had a slope of zero, there's something else important here that we could find we could calculate the area underneath that curve. And I've just highlighted it here with a blue rectangle. Now, you may already know that to find area, you multiply the height by the width of the rectangle. And in this case, the height right here represents change in velocity because it's on the change in velocity or on the velocity axis. But the width of the rectangle represents the time. So if we calculate the area by multiplying delta v times delta t, well delta v times delta t, that gives us a distance. And again, we can check that with the units. If you multiply meters per second times seconds, the seconds cancels out and we're just left with the unit meters. That's a distance unit. So the area underneath a velocity versus time graph tells us the distance traveled while the object was traveling. We can also do the same thing if we have uh, this slope line for the red line. We could calculate the area underneath it. It's just that it's a little bit more difficult to calculate because it's not just um, a rectangle. But if we calculate the area of that shape, that would still tell us how far the object traveled during that time period. Finally, our last graph is an acceleration versus time graph. And uh, for our motion, it turns out that acceleration versus time graphs are almost always horizontal. If the object wasn't traveling at all, that would be a constant acceleration of zero. 
if it was falling due to the acceleration of gravity, it would be falling at the constant rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. So in this class, almost all the motion we study will have an acceleration graph that has a horizontal line on it. There are cases where objects will have a changing acceleration, but uh, we'll save those for a later class. Since almost everything we analyze will have a horizontal acceleration versus time graph, I'm not going to really worry about the slope here. But let's think about uh, that other thing that we talked about. If we look at the area underneath the curve, which once again, I'll represent that with a blue rectangle. If we look at that area underneath the curve this time, if we find that area by taking the rise or the height divided by the multiplied by the width, in that case that would be this distance, which is the acceleration measured in meters per second squared, multiplied by this quantity, which is time measured in seconds. Now we see that we have a quantity where we have acceleration multiplied by a time, and if we look at the units, that would be meters per second squared multiplied by meters. That would cancel out. I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly. It would be meters per second squared multiplied by seconds. One of the seconds would cancel out, and that would unit leave us with the unit meters per second. Meters per second is an average velocity. So an acceleration time versus time graph is important because if we calculate the area underneath it, it will tell us the average velocity of the object traveling during that time period.